Hi everybody, it's Josh with Talk About Trek, and I'm back today with something different. We've read a Voyager novel, finally. I have read one before, but this is the first time I've kind of dove into the past of the Voyager novels. Uh, the one I read recently was To Lose the Earth. So uh, now we've dived into Mosaic by Jerry Taylor. And I don't know what made me choose Mosaic. Uh, just spent a while looking at the shelf. And that's what jumped out at me. And I did have the choice. I could have went with the paperback. I could have went with the hardcover. I've got them both here. Uh, and I chose to read the paperback. Because I do beat them up fairly well. And I'll leave my nice hardcover alone. But I always like to look. And the colors on this one are pretty nice. So check that out. Nice blue and yellow with some red. But uh, we left that one just fine. And uh, instead, read the paperback. So that's what we'll read the, the back from here today. Uh, Mosaic was published in 1996, written by, of course, Jerry Taylor, the co-creator and the executive producer of the hit TV series, Star Trek Voyager. So, you know, you're getting it right from the horse's mouth as far as what you have here. And what do you have here? You have, revealed at last, the untold story of Catherine Janeway. And that's definitely where this book really shines, is in getting to learn more about her past. Because, I mean, I, I, obviously her character is like one of the the greatest in Star Trek. Oh, look, this was sold at Kmart. Kmart back in the day. Uh, in my own opinion. But um, one of my favorite captains, and just an overall, just a really interesting character. And to get to learn more about her background in this book was very cool. So uh, let's read the back here together for the first time. <clears throat> Deep in the Delta Quadrant, a surprise Kazon attack leaves Captain Janeway fighting a desperate battle on two fronts. While USS Voyager duels the Kazon warship amidst a gaseous nebula, an away team is trapped on the surface of a wilderness planet and stalked by superior Kazon ground forces. Forced to choose between the safety of her ship and the lives of her friends, Janeway relives the most important moments in her life. From her childhood to her first passionate love affair, from her early not really from her early triumphs to her greatest tragedy, Janeway's past is uncovered as she faces the choices that have made her the woman she is today. The woman who must now risk everything to carve one more pattern in the mosaic that is Catherine Janeway. A powerful new novel by the co-creator and executive producer of Star Trek Voyager. Mosaic. Available for $5.99 at your local Kmart there. Anyway, what did I think of this book before we just dive into the whole story and all that good stuff? Uh, it was really fun. It's um, the... Kind of the story itself that's going on isn't like the most deep and in-depth kind of thing, uh, but that's not really what's going on here. The story that we're looking at here is learning more about Janeway and getting these little glimpses into these little pieces of her past that kind of made her who she is today. So uh, th that's really where this book shines. So, I mean, if you want to know more about Janeway, again, you're getting it from the creator of the show so this is like the the best source of that so as far as i'm concerned this is like you know canon stuff so uh, again the uh the focus is on her so there, there's not too much else uh tuvok harry kim Kess, or maybe the other main players but again uh that's a small part in this it's mostly just kind of looking back at her story and some incredible tragedies that she has went through in her life that made her, you know, who she is today. So, and also just interesting backstory and the kind of fun little bits thrown in, little cameos that, that you wouldn't expect uh, from some characters. So, I would say a definite recommendation for any Voyager fan. And again, if you want some more backstory on Janeway, uh, this is where you're going to get it. Read Mosaic. So... Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Um, other than that, let's just dive into the story and kind of rant and rave and uh, have some fun with that because 
it was it was interesting. Uh, full spoilers from here on out. We'll just go right on into the whole thing here. But the book is split between, and I've read quite a few books that are like this. But basically, the book is split between uh, a recount of the past and then uh, what's going on currently in the story. And while it's not perfect, like you know, chapter for chapter, back and forth, it kind of goes back and forth that way, with maybe a greater focus on what's going on in Janeway's past. And it kind of starts it out... And when you're talking about a book like this, too, you always get to the point where, like, you don't want to talk about, like, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you know? So I'll just try to cover some of the Janeway stuff first, and then maybe we'll go and cover what's going on with Voyager. Well, we'll start with what's going on with Voyager. Uh, This is early in... The time they've been there, I think they've been there for maybe six months or something. So they're still within the reaches of Kazon territory. And the Kazon were never too exciting of a villain for the for Voyager. And they moved on from that because they kind of realized, obviously, that they weren't. Uh, they were always just kind of dumb and just like, I, I don't know, just really, just not compelling. Not compelling as villains. Uh, but that's who you have as the villain in this, is the uh, the Kazon and they are being hunted by the Kazon. Uh, well, basically, they're they're on the search for food, so they're going to different planets looking for food, and uh, they're told when they get to this certain area that there could be, like, a Kazon approaching or whatever, and they uh, they go and they look for the food anyway, and the Kazon approaches. So this Kazon uh, craft led by this Majdut, this certain tribe of Kazon, is after Voyager, and is also after what is on this planet that they're currently on. So Voyager's away team is beamed down, and the Kazon come and attack. So it's one of those situations where they gotta, the Voyager's got to take off, you know, and leave the away team kind of stranded down on the planet in the meanwhile while they head off to hide in a gaseous nebula. Like, how many times does that happen in Star Trek, right? There's always a good gaseous nebula that you can hide in, so... So they're able to successfully hide in the gaseous nebula. On the away team, uh, you have a little bit of kind of interest in action in the beginning there, where uh, they're trying to get away from this Kazon ground crew. So Neelix is leading this team of uh, kind of a younger team through some underbrush and some like creeping vines and things like that, and they get attacked by all these snakes and. Uh, so a nice little kind of fun scene there at the beginning, but the crew is eventually able to find a uh, underground chamber, which Harry Kim is able to activate, and they're able to open, get inside, and that's where they take refuge from the Kazon. Now this chamber also shields their life signs from Voyager, so they're not able to be detected or beamed up. So, again, up there in orbit, they took off, they went to the gaseous nebula. So now you can have a little bit of time of... Uh, flashback for Captain Janeway. So, and again, the story is split more than I'm representing it here in, in my telling, but uh, I'll just kind of keep it this way. So, the initial early telling of her life story is basically her love of her father and her want to impress her father, who is in Starfleet and is currently kind of fully involved in whatever is going on with the Cardassians. And the Cardassians at that point kind of had just been discovered and, like, they're trying to do what they can to prevent war. So there's this kind of undercurrent in the beginning of her dad being distracted and what he has to do with these Cardassians, but always being, like, proud of her. So she grew up in Indiana and she grew up in, like, a traditionalist home so that she was raised and her mom didn't like you to use replicated food. They had, like, a real fireplace in the house. And she also went to a different school than, like, the kind of prep for Starfleet Academy school that she would have wanted to go to. She was also forced to play tennis, which she didn't like at first, but then kind of later grew to like as well. And then in her kind of young years, she was just trying to show her dad basically how smart she was, wanted to get his approval, and really did excel, basically, at everything that she put her mind to. Uh, 
some other characters are introduced during that time. There's a character called Hobbs Johnson, who uh, she at first doesn't really like. He, he's like kind of like uh, lanky and has like a a weird walk or something like that and just doesn't really want to interact with him but they have a little cave diving adventure together and have some fun there and uh, becomes kind of like a friend to her so uh, so you get these kind of just little glimpses of her growing up and the things that she's doing and the things that she's getting into um, they have a little misadventure where she sneaks into a, a mansion somewhere in Ohio uh, supposedly a haunted mansion or something where then they're met by this creepy old lady who throws a candlestick at them. They put out the fire and all the other cadets leave. This is when she's a cadet. But then she has to save to save the lady and then gives her like a comment. So it's, there's some little weird stories like that, but it's just fun. There's fun little kind of anecdotes. So that's the one thing about this. It's almost like a, uh, like a collection of little short stories. Because the main story, even though there's like kind of a thread through like the past, uh, the main story is fairly small. But, again, what you're getting is just a, a glimpse into Janeway's life and how she became who she was, you know, pieces of the mosaic, right? So that's what they're going for. All right, so before things get too serious in the past, because they do get fairly serious, uh, we'll go back to the planet. And on the planet, the away team, first off, the Kazon on the surface are like, just total dolts like they're ridiculous uh, the guy leading the thing is just kind of post like posturing and just trying to impress everybody when everybody else kind of knows that they've lost them and they don't really know what they're doing eventually they just resort to firing their phasers into the ground because they know that they're under there somewhere so uh underneath the ground harry kim and kess are searching for maybe some kind of exit or something uh kess has a kind of telepathic tickle and is able to feel something so they follow that they find a set of stairs which go down and down and down and down and down before they find this strange room and in this strange room uh, once they get in like the door shuts behind them and they're met with this hologram of a humanoid type creature and Kess is able to kind of telepathically sort that he's talking about some kind of awakening and he's saying, well, welcome to the awakening here. Um, and then the room starts getting really, really hot. So and that's kind of what's happening there on the planet. We don't know what this awakening is yet. So back in the, uh, in the nebula, well, they do kind of cut shortly to what's going on on the Kazon ship. And on the Kazon ship, they give you a glimpse of kind of what, what's to come here. And there is a... A physician, a captured physician, who is a, a trabe, a species that was kind of conquered by the Kazon. His name is Trachus, and he's been ordered to experiment on this creature that they have, which kind of looks like a, a human-sized like insect, basically. So he's got it sedated, and he's doing all these things, and he keeps telling these Kazon that, you know, if I keep this thing sedated, it's just going to die. They don't really care. They want to find out how they can use this thing as a weapon. Like, that's their whole idea. So, they're currently doing that, trying to figure out how they can use this thing as a weapon. So, they introduce this character of Trachus there. And then uh, the, the jerk on the Kazon ship is named, like, I don't know, and, and something. Uh, anyway, they're led by Maj Dut. So, uh, he's the one that's kind of pushing for all these experiments on this thing, which eventually dies. The thing eventually dies. And then the, uh, the scientist kind of saves his own hide by saying, well, I know even though he's dead, I can still learn something by doing some experiments or something like that. So uh, th that's what they go for with that then. That's your little glimpse of what's going on on that ship there. So far, they don't really give the motivations too much of what the Kazon is doing, other than they're trying to hunt down the Federation on the planet. So, uh, Back in the gaseous nebula, they realize they've got to do something to figure out a way to save the, uh, the away team. They're kind of working furiously to restore systems. They've had some phasers down and some other things, so they're getting closer to having everything put back together. 
So then we'll kind of dive back into the past of what was going on more with Janeway. Now things kind of get more serious. You have, uh, she's no longer a cadet. She's on her first science mission. And she is uh, rather close with Admiral Paris. And she has been in a few other scenes before this as well. And of course, that is Tom Paris's dad. So that was one of the fun little, uh, I guess that wasn't really a cameo. That was kind of a really big part of the book. There were cameos, though, that I didn't speak of before by two cadets, Cadet Data and Cadet William Riker. So those were some kind of just funny little moments that I think she threw in, uh, which just kind of added something extra, I think, to, to those little past stories, you know? Just those little moments where these two characters did meet at some point, you know, which we've never seen before. So now we have the first actual Starfleet mission for Janeway. And it's supposed to be a science mission out near the Cardassian border. And looking at like extra, what was it, like extra large halo objects or something like that. So she's really excited to do that. On their way out there, they are briefed that this is a two-part mission. And there's a secret kind of... Um, information gathering mission that they're going on as well just to kind of see what the Cardassians are doing uh, so they're told that once right at the beginning and after that they're basically told we're not going to mention this again uh, just go about your work as normal uh, also there's a team of highly trained rangers aboard you don't know who they are but they're here so it's at this point when they introduce the character of Justin I guess Justin Tig, Justin Tig. We're just going to call him Justin. And Justin is a science officer, and Janeway is paired with him and kind of works with adjusting the sensors and getting the sensors to, you know, scan these large halo objects or whatever. So that's the first little cut that you get of that. So uh, after that, the next one is uh, Admiral Paris and Janeway are on a shuttlecraft mission away from the ship. And they, uh, they are captured by the Cardassians. Of course, they're captured by the Cardassians, right? So now you have this kind of really dark scene where Janeway's undergoing Cardassian torture. She's locked in a cage where she can't, like, stretch out or stand up or anything like that. Uh, cold, uh, uncomfortable. And then she's brought to... Uh, just so much reminiscent of a chain of command, you know, when Picard was tortured, uh, brought before Cardassian, who was trying to be nice, and then put back in the cage, and then she had to sit and listen to the tortured screams of Admiral Paris as he was, like, implanted with a Cardassian pain device and just tortured for hours on end. Uh, eventually, they are rescued by the Rangers, and of course the Rangers are led by Justin. Justin comes to save the day. Uh, gets her out of there, gets her to the woods, and uh, then goes back for Admiral Paris. They get him out of there as well. Uh, when he comes back for her, uh, they're pursued by Cardassians, and he falls and twists his ankle. And she, he orders, he orders her to leave him. He won't. She won't do it. And she grabs him. They both jump into the mud, and they put some straws in their mouth, and they hide underneath this mud. And they uh, they escape the Cardassians, and they're like uh, awful dogs. So they hide for a bit. Then they're able to run to the beam out site where they have to fight off another Cardassian and his dog before they're able to uh, get beamed out and are uh, rescued. So again, that's another really cool little scene in the book, and just a very interesting backstory to add for her as well. Just that she's had to endure this kind of deal with the Cardassians, so. So, yeah, after that, she realizes that she kind of falls in love with this Justin. So, over the course of her Starfleet career, maybe over the next year or so, they, they fall in love, and uh, he uh, ends up working with her dad in this um, design of this kind of uh, experimental spaceship, I guess, starship. And... In this book, it's pretty dark, right? So, what happens? The experimental starship goes awry and crashes onto an icy planet. 
and Janeway is like in one part of the ship that gets ejected onto the ice and then she has to watch as like another is like this basically she's like a big iceberg and she knows that the other part of the ship has already crashed into the water and it's gone and that's all she remembers it's like that's dark it's like her dad and her basically her fiance dead under the ice and that's what and then she kind of falls and do like a depression after that where she just sleeps and sleeps and sleeps and sleeps for like months before she is pulled out of that depression and saved by her sister Phoebe and then Phoebe kind of gets her to come out of bed and just keep going and do something and she agrees even though she's still kind of like shut down inside uh, one day she goes out for a walk in the blizzard kind of thinking of just dropping down and ending it all when she finds a little puppy and it's the same little puppy that she has in the beginning, right? right it's got to be. Anyway, so anyway, she finds a little puppy, and the little puppy is almost dead. And saving the puppy is what kind of brings her back to life and saves her as well. So she's pulled out of this depression and uh, is able to make it back to her, her next posting for Starfleet. And then the story kind of skips ahead from there. And then it goes to her very first captaincy. And she's returning from her first run as a captain. And she has to go through this review where everybody says she did a great job. But then she's given the security review by a young Vulcan ensign who says that she didn't do this and that and the other thing. And didn't do enough tests and she didn't do enough drills. And she needs to follow the exact procedure. And she, of course, is incensed. She's like, well, who is this guy to tell me how to run my ship? I'm a deep space captain. Uh, but Starfleet kind of agrees with him as well and assigns this young Vulcan ensign to uh, her command. And of course who is this? It's Tuvok, of course. So that's also cool that basically like Tuvok has been with her since her very first command. And like this is how they meet when they're like she's like at odds with him basically. So now one part of the story that I haven't talked about is that she always has this reoccurring dream future Janeway, doesn't show it in the past, of like, uh, or present Janeway, of this house with these doors. And she has to always open this door, and she can't open this door. She knows she has to get in that door. There's something she's got to clean in there, you know? But she can't open the door. It's like a block in her head. And she has this dream, and she can't ever figure out what it is. And it's not something that's, like, terribly disconcerting, but it's, like, always there for her, you know? So keep that in mind with the door, so... So that's about the end of like the, the, the past section of the book. And I've definitely left out a lot. So don't just listen to me talk about it. Go read it for yourself because you can learn so much more about what she went through in the past. Uh, but continuing the main story. And this is when the main story kind of gets really interesting and crazy. Uh, what is actually going on on that planet, this awakening, is this awakening of these what are called the Tokath. Oh, and I guess we got to go back to the, uh, the Voyager too. Uh, on the Kazon ship, the doctor has devised a way to send out a signal, knowing that his usefulness is kind of at an end. So he's contacted the captain, and Janeway has agreed to do something to save him. So they do that at great risk to themselves, and in that battle they, they take quite a few hits because they got to drop shields to let this guy on. But they do get the doctor off, and that's when they find out what the Tokath are all about. So, down on the planet, in that cave system, are these hibernating insectoid Tokath, which are basically like a defensive creature created by the Krell thousands of years ago. However, the Krell and the Tokath were all wiped out nearly by like a, a radiation burst from their sun. So what the Krell did was put all their Tokath basically in stasis, kind of stuck into the walls in these little gel sacks, right? So they're all in stasis, and that's what's going on right now. When Harry and Kess went down into that room, uh, they turned on this awakening, basically, and they activated that. So uh, when everything got really hot in that room, that was what was going on. And now the rest of the away team is kind of like right in the middle, of all these creatures coming out of the walls. Luckily, they're able to make it down to the bottom of the steps, get into the safe room down there at the bottom, uh, and avoid the 
the creatures that are all awakening, all these Tokath. The uh, Kazan that are searching for them, however, are not so lucky. And uh, you get this kind of very gory and brutal description of how these creatures first spit like they don't spit it actually like shoots out of their stomach like melty goo you know like from the dinosaur in Jurassic Park basically but maybe even worse maybe think of like the aliens from Alien yeah the aliens from Alien they shoot that goo on you first and you can't wipe it off because it just gets on you and it melts you you're melting and then they come and they eat you intestines first like literally like that and they describe like the whole thing is terrible so like these things are awful and now they are coming out in full force from this thing and they are not only built just for the ground and the land and the air they're built for space and which is what the doctor has told them so now you have these basically this swarm of millions of these tokath flying up into space approaching the ships of course the kazan they just start blasting they don't care so the Tokath kind of swarm after them first and start getting around their shields. Voyager takes the opportunity, or Janeway does, to try to get closer to the planet. And they go to condition blue, which means you're landing on a planet. I think I didn't even know that, or maybe I forgot it. But condition blue is a failure. As they get closer to the planet, these little guys start sticking onto the shields. And they're like secreting their goo through the shields even. So they go up into space, try to shake them off, and they can't even do that. They're still secreting their goo through the shields, right? So they've got like a bunch of these guys on their shields. They're going to get through soon. What are they going to do? They hightail it for the sun, and they're going to burn them off. So they get closer and closer to the sun. They're still not getting off. These guys are like really super tough. They're not leaving. They activate the metaphasic shield program, right? That's from a TNG episode, so that's good you gotta love that and with that they're able to get close enough to the sun these guys finally let go and burn off or whatever and they're free of these guys getting through their shields and eating all their intestines so that's good we didn't want to see that happening to our crew there so the crew of the voyager now is uh safe from the, the evil bugs but now they've got to rescue their away team and now we get to know the secret of what's behind the door Ooh, just like Picard season three, right? But no, with this one, um, they're kind of at this point where even Chakotay is like, how can we go back, Captain? If we go back, those things are going to get us again, and there's nothing we can do. We have to leave the away team, and we have to run for it. And that's when she kind of like goes back inside of her head for one final trip into the past, where you get to see what actually happened that day when the experimental ship crashed. And this is pretty dark. Uh, so she woke up in the snow in a part of her ship which was still somewhat operational but obviously broken up. Uh, and it wasn't an iceberg that she saw up ahead sinking into the water. It was the other part of her ship. And not only could she see the other part of her ship, she could see it so clearly she could see into the cabin of the ship where she could see her fiancé and her father, both obviously still alive, and but bleeding and hurt, and kind of bent over their consoles. Like, oh my god. <laughs> like, how terrible. And the thing's slowly sinking into the water, right? So, she does everything she can to cobble enough transporter power together uh, and see what she can do to, to save them, to save both of them. And then she's kind of met with this realization that she can only save one. She can't save both. But she can't make the decision. And she keeps working to save both of them. She finally gets enough power to activate the beam and save both of them. But it's too late. The ship is sunk beneath the surface of the water. She's not able to get a lock on. And now she's lost both of them to the depths. And then she basically screams and stomps her foot so hard that like her broken leg makes her like pass out from the pain and she forgets about all this until just now at this point in the story so it was just now like literally like when she remembered that she had the opportunity to save one and couldn't do it so now when she has that realization she's like well there's just no way that we can leave our crew behind 
And even though that, uh, even though that they don't have a good plan, there's something that she has to do. So she just basically kind of closes her eyes and visions the problem like she would do so often as a child and sees a way through what she's doing or sees a way through the dilemma. And, uh, she's asked the doctor about the burst that first affected that planet. And then she's able to come up with a way to inject a nadion particle beam into the sun to recreate that event, which sends all the creatures back into hibernation. They've already totally destroyed the Kazon ship uh, in the meantime, and, uh, basically turned it into a, a floating graveyard. Uh, but now they're all back into hibernation safely. And um, the crew or the, the away team is able to exit the chamber. They get beamed back up. And everybody lives happily ever after. That's it. So again, the, the story on the planet was kind of the smaller part. And mainly what you're getting here is just this very cool background of Captain Janeway and it was it was so worth it so and I just love these books too that kind of take two stories or more than two and kind of tie them together and I think Jerry Taylor tied them together really well in the end with kind of how the reveal in her past was able to solve her current dilemma so I'm going to tie in more Voyager books I'm going to tell you that because I had a lot of fun with this and I was afraid to start the numbered series for already reading through the TNG numbered series, but we're definitely going to get some more in there. Uh, but there's so much other stuff too, so we'll see where we go. I don't know where we're going from here, but probably back to the TNG numbered series for at least a couple. So as always, everybody, thank you so much for spending some time talking about Trek with me today. Uh, live long and prosper. And we will see everybody for the next one. Bye.